All right, good morning, everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Michaela McCain. I am going to appear as Jason Robinson just because we use his account for WebEx. Um, but if you have any questions or need anything, you can always send me a private message. You can send it to Jason and it'll pop up on my chat screen if you're having any issues hearing or if you want to be anonymous and submit a question, you don't want to chime in. Okay, so. I did just want to go over a few housekeeping things. So when you came into the meeting, you should have already been muted, but you can just double check at the bottom of your screen. If you see on my PowerPoint, you can see I circled a red box. Um, just make sure that you have a little mic with a line through it. Um, but we do want today to be interactive. So feel free to utilize the chat box feature um, or you can um, unmute yourself and pop in with a question. I know they, they definitely want a lot of interaction today. So please, I hope you came with questions. Um, another thing is if you want to find the chat box, if you look down towards the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a little chat bubble. Um, it's in like a blue font right now um, on my screen. So if you just click that, that'll pull the chat box up for you as well. Um, we are recording today's webinar. We'll have it posted on our external website um, on our training outreach page in about a week. Uh, we have to download the recording and get it um, put in a different file format. So we'll have that posted out there as well. Um, if you've been registered for this, I will send an email notifying you once part one and part two of this webinar. We're going to post them the same day. So once both parts are posted, um, I'll send you an email just letting you know that we have everything that's been posted. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Russ real quick. Hey, thanks, Michaela. Um, this is Russ, the local assistance uh, division director. I, um, I, I introduced uh, the webinar yesterday and we're uh, coming back. Thank you so much for coming back and taking uh, uh, being a part of this uh, part two of our, of our two part webinar here. If you were not here yesterday and this is your uh, you know, you missed us, you missed a good session. We had a lot of good questions. Um, it got us a lot of good dialogue and I certainly appreciate uh, all the interaction. That's what really helps people when you ask questions. Um, it answers questions people, maybe people didn't even think they knew or didn't even know they had. So uh, please ask questions, don't be shy. Um, Today, we're going to do something we don't normally do. We haven't done a lot of in the past, and that's get the perspective of our contractor. And, um, you know, these are the folks that actually take what we put on piece of pieces of paper and turn it into reality. So I think it's really important that we get their perspectives on, on our projects. And uh, I think we're going to do more of this in the future. So, again, don't be shy. Ask questions. That's what we're here for. We're here to answer your questions, clarify any any issues and thanks again and with that i'm going to turn it over to harold with our construction division to kick things off harold thank you russ appreciate it um if you can go ahead and flip over perfect thank you uh, michaela i do want to <clears throat> excuse me before we get started michaela can you give us a quick breakdown of do we have this a uh, very close to the same number of participants as yesterday i'm going to use some of the poll questions from yesterday's session, but uh, are we in that 200 range or did we lose some folks? Um, it looks like we still have some people popping in. Yesterday, we ended up having, um, I think at our highest, we had about 190 people that actually joined the call. Um, okay. Right now, we're at 134. Okay, thank you. Um, just to give you some, um, from Mike and Buddy perspective, uh, just to catch you back up, the, uh, um, we had about we did some poll questions yesterday from an organizational standpoint of who was representing what uh, we had 63 poll uh, folks poll back that they were with a locality. We had about 10 central office, 15 district or local liaisons, and then we had 17 other. I'm not quite sure what those were, but um, that's how they represented themselves. And uh, also they had uh, we polled to see whether or not from the standpoint of federal aid contracts and, and what they're actually doing at an agency level. And we had uh, 30 participants say they do small amount, which is up to five projects. We had uh, 35 say they were a medium amount. That was six to 19 projects annually. And then uh, 21 said they were a large amount with 20 plus contracts um, a year, just to kind of give you perspective of the audience that we uh, should be talking to today, buddy Mike. 
So everybody that was on the phone call yesterday, again, Russ, thank you for the introduction. My name is Harold Caples. I'm the state contract engineer. I work in the construction division here in central office and um, responsible for all the design, bid, build, procurement, estimating, uh, getting the contracts actually ex executed, as Russ had said, getting um, those paper documents actually translated to the field, if you will. Luck, uh, I, I'm lucky to have uh, two industry representatives with me today. That's uh, Buddy League. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. These slides, uh, I'm going to let um, folks read those. But Buddy's president of Branscombe Inc. He is, works with both the, de the department as well as local agencies and I'm sure private development as well. Um, he brings almost 30 years worth of experience to um, in, in the construction industry to uh, the department and our local partners um, from a project perspective. We're lucky, like I said, here again, I, I can't thank both Buddy or Mike enough for taking the time to share their perspectives as, as subject matter experts um, with what we're talking about today. So, um, Buddy, I, do you have anything you wanna say real quick before I move over to Mike? Give you an opportunity to introduce yourself or what not? No, no. Thank you, Harold, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today and uh, be with all of you guys. And we look forward to a great uh, conference. And uh, you know, as as Harold and Russ have said, we're we're looking forward to an open dialogue and uh, open to any questions. So thanks for having me, and thanks for the introduction, Harold. Thanks, buddy. All right, Michaela, can you go to the next slide? So, Mike Colbert is joining us today from Branch Civil. He is the vice president of estimating there, and here again, another industry leader and um, bringing a lot of prior experience and history to our uh, projects. He's kind of been all over, so is Buddy as well. But um, I'm going to let Mike, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say or add? Uh, sure, Harold. I appreciate the invitation to join the group today. I'm looking forward to a good dialogue. Sure. Like something out of, this, out of the back. Definitely. So um, I kind of started to allude to some of the stuff that we did yesterday, and I did share um, just for the group's knowledge. Buddy and Mike both saw the uh, presentation that uh, FHW, and I, FHWA and I did yesterday. So they're aware of the, of what the kind of do's and don'ts approach that we took. Today, um, as I alluded to yesterday, we're gonna, we're, we're, this is, we really want that interaction. I was very impressed with the number of comments and questions we got in the chat box yesterday. I'm gonna be kind of throwing out a topic just to kind of give everybody a layout. We're not gonna do a lot of PowerPoint today. You've seen the extent of the PowerPoint. The next slide is questions. And we're going to kind of roll through um, a lot of different topics. We're going to spend a few minutes kind of discussing them really from the uh, contractor's perspective, because what, what this is, yesterday we talked about things that we see, we VDOT and FHWA have seen through CAP reviews, through our reviews of IFBs, trying to get authorization to go to add an award. We're going to try and translate some of those things. I, I know there was a big theme yesterday that I saw in the question to chat window is talking about risk and uh, from the localities perspective, we're going to try and translate that to the risk from the contractors perspective, because ultimately, one of the key themes, I think everybody heard yesterday, um, you know, should have walked away with was competition. We want competitive bids. We want more, you know, the more contractors we have looking at work, the better it is for us, the better price we're going to get. And ultimately, I think the better job we're going to get completed um, from a construction standpoint. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let me, got a lot of windows going here. We're gonna go ahead and just jump into this. So just, I, I encourage everyone, we're not gonna, we, we'll go back and question, we'll address questions at the end holistically, um, but we're gonna um, jump into this. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday from the FHWA and VDOT perspective with the locals was quality review on contract um, documents and contract development. And what we were really talking about there is um, the specifics, common errors in, in an IFB, uh, not including completion dates, 
uh, specification references um, on the bid, you know, not being clear, whether measurement payments not clear or not concise. So I, I know how, and I'm going to also interject to some extent of how VDOT addresses these things with, with Mike and Buddy, but, but I really want Mike and Buddy to kind of weigh in and I, I'll just round robin it. So I'm going to kick it to Buddy first. Um, how, how do you, how do you view the, uh, contract documents when they're, we'll say, incomplete from the perspective of not clear in, in what it is we're asking for or how we plan on paying for things? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Harold. Um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, there are a lot of different components to, to, to risk. Um, you know, obviously, you know, a level of complexity uh, when we're dealing with locally administered projects where you have a, a set of specs that are uh, from the municipality or, or the local locality. And we also have a, a set of specs that is uh, specific to VDOT. You know, so those, those two combined, you know, create a level of complexity that we really have to analyze and make sure that the locality specs are consistent with VDOT and where there are inconsistencies, you know, we have to make accommodations for those, those particular types of issues. Uh, you know, the one thing that, uh, you know, is very consistent for us is, is working with, with VDOT. And, you know, we know, we know their specs, we know the measurement and payments on on line items, you know. But where we we really have to analyze uh, on locally administered projects is where there are special uh, accommodations in local specifications that may contradict, uh, you know, what what's in in VDOT specs, and we've seen that on on several several occasions. Um, you know, and one one big example is we have you know some municipalities that bid uh, bid their projects on a lump sum basis, and uh, if there if there is any degree of risk, that is probably one of the larger items of risk that that we have to uh, take into account. And uh, you know, if if a locality chooses to bid. A lump sum project, they, they need to understand that they are they are paying extra uh, for for that risk. You know, beyond that, you know, there's uh, you know, depending on the project, the size, the complexity, you know, there's levels of risk that that come along with size. And there's levels of risk that that come along with with complexity, and uh, you know, as those projects get more complex. As they get larger, you know, you're going to see a reduction in the in the competitiveness uh, of those projects, you know, because there's only uh, a certain few uh, companies around the state or companies that work with your individual locality that uh, that can take on that that level of of risk. Um, so if, hey, there you go, Harold. Thank you, buddy. Mike, I, I wanted to let you speak there for a minute, and then we'll have a little dialogue there. I think he did well stating it. Um, yeah, buddy hit on it. You know, I, I would agree with him 100% that, you know, one of our riskiest uh, items as we look at uh, contract delivery is uh, lump sum contracts. Uh, and the larger, the, the more risk is, and, uh, you know, it's, how contractors typically deal with the uh, with the uh, risk is applying a dollar value to it. So, you know, I thought he stated it well. Okay, so um, I, I heard I had a couple kind of themes there that I was writing down. We talked about, um, and I guess initially we there was some discussion about the 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 contract documents themselves and uniqueness from locality to locality, and and the fact that I think you even compared to VDOT. You know, um, as we as I alluded to in the beginning, um, 
I'm I'm responsible for the procurement of all nine construction districts statewide. So there's a level of consistency there. So you pick up a contract from Hampton Roads out on the Eastern Shore or Bristol District out close to uh, Kentucky, they, in theory, conceptually look very similar. They're obviously uniqueness from project to project, but from a, from the big, I guess, big picture perspective, there's a level of consistency there um, that we that that y'all have grown accustomed to. Yeah, that that's true, Harold. I mean, you guys aren't perfect at VDOT, that's for sure, and the consistency can vary from uh, from district to district. But the one thing that is consistent is are those contract specifications, the measurement and payment. Now, how they get applied in the field, you know, can can vary, but uh, you know, there's usually remedies for that where where when we disagree. Okay. I know that that was one of the, we asked some some um, poll questions yesterday, and one of the questions that we asked and polled the audience on was in regards to how many use standard IFB templates uh, created by, we asked a group outside, there are some um, resources out there that have uh, standardization, if you will. Um, it was a very low, we had 13 folks say they uh, use standard IFB templates created by group outside of the locality and 53 said no. Um, just just from, you know, just a straight up polling perspective. Uh, that was a kind of a point of a question and there was a lot more discussion and follow up in regards to um, that that standardization there and and I you know there very well may be more to come in the future in regards to that um, and hopefully a partnership there uh, we you also y'all both mentioned the lump sum um, concept or approach I guess just to delve into that a little bit more uh, you know from a risk perspective obviously I, I very clearly heard y'all both say that um, those lump sum contracts typically we we pay a we, VDOT, and the local partners end up paying um, a higher price, quite frankly. There's a premium put on that lump sum because you're having to incur some risk, some unknowns um, that, uh, that you know, you're, you're having to gauge based on the, the documents in front of you. Uh, when you're submitting your bid, I, I guess, um, how do you approach that what, what, from a risk threshold standpoint, more specifically, um, at what point does it become too risky maybe for you to even look at, this goes back to that competitiveness, that competitive, um, where we're trying to get competitive bids and, and contractors, more contractors chasing work, uh, you know, from a threshold and obviously as much as you can give us, you know, where is that? you know, tipping point to go, look, this just isn't, this is too risky. I, 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 I'm going to price myself out of this because of the risk. And, and therefore I'm not going to even, I, I don't want to say waste my time, but I'm not going to spend the level of effort because there's time and money that, that you, you um, incur to submit a bid. You chase a lot of, you know, you have to go to suppliers and material, you know, you've got all the DBEs, you've got all these components that you're having to chase. So there, there's a cost to incur to, to chasing work. At what point does that just kind of, that balance just not exist? Mike, I, I, I'll that's, kick it to you first. That's a, that's a pretty tough one to answer, Harold. But <laughs> I, I mean, holistically, I, I yeah, obviously. No, I, I think that, you know, you know, every project is, is, you know, as branch, you know, I represent branch and we look at every project individually, um, try to get a thorough understanding of, of the documents and the time frame of the project and the, you know, the, the delivery time frames as well. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a compressed bid schedule, um, an aggressive bid schedule from our perspective anyway, as the contractor. Uh, Two weeks to bid a, a good sized job is just not enough time. I'll just lay that out there. Um, uh, you know, the long, the, if we've got some long lead time where we can get some thorough scope clarifications and things like that, it, you know, that reduces the risk. But you know, there's all of those aspects leading up to that point. You know, the the, the overall timing of the schedule, of the project itself, uh, delivery time frame, fixed end dates versus calendar days. You know, the just the and there's you know. Many, many municipalities on this call, you know, everybody's got a different, uh, a different way they handle those kind of things. Um, so I, I'll, I'll lead it back to kind of that, you know, 
the consistency, you know, that we're that we're used to is, you know, typically, you know, our largest customer as a corporation is is VDOT. Uh, so we we're, we're very familiar with with what we have to do there, and when you have to apply that on top of individual municipalities uh, interpretation and approach to the delivery it's a, um, that's kind of where we look at it from the start is saying all right what's what's the overall time frame and then let me let me see if the, where the conflicts are within the within the drawings and specifications and uh, I, I can we can talk about this particular item for a long time because this sure. is this is a, this well, and, and, this I, and I'll be to, and say, to say there's a threshold there you know every every project stands on its own and, and on its own merit. Sure, and and just to give, I guess, Mike and Buddy know, we, we've had some prior conversations, obviously, to this to this meeting, and just to give everyone else the, I guess, prior knowledge here, I have, uh, you know, we have relationships with VTCA and other industry groups that represent um, our industry as a whole, and I know that I have heard point blank um, projects, and, and as they refer, or, at referencing specifically local projects where contractors just um, have found for whatever reason uh, that they chose not to chase a job because of that risk allocation, risk threshold, it just didn't um, make sense for them. And, and in those situations here, again, it goes back to that competitiveness. Um, so that, that kind of was how I was framing it up. Buddy, I don't know if you wanted to speak at all. I mean, obviously I know we're not talking about a project specific issue necessarily but just as a whole you know it comes down to that risk threshold and at some point it's just you look at a number that that may be disclosed as a as a total budget and you're nowhere near that so at some point it's just not worth <laughs> chasing quite frankly yeah and that's a good point i really you know, concur with mike i mean we uh it, it's a matter of time as well uh i, I can't say that there's a certain threshold uh, you know, project that, you know, if it goes over a certain amount that, that we wouldn't, wouldn't take a look at it. As long as we have the time to adequately uh, address the risk items and, you know, so everybody knows, I mean, what, what we do, yeah, we may have a schedule of unit units uh, and quantities that, that we're working off of, but, you know, I know Branscombe does, and I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, Branch does as well. We take that job off again, you know. So we we know, you know, from a project perspective, we know where those risk items are. We know where those quantity differences are, and uh, and you know we we address that in our in our pricing. Uh, if there's if there's time. Uh, constraints that uh, that we can't we feel like we can't get a job done within a, uh, the time frame specified. You know, we address that in our in our bid as well. And uh, you know, I can say that uh, you know for the localities that have you know uh, robust uh, bidding system with uh, a system of taking questions. And answering those questions, you know, those those questions are are key to uh, a, a, an inside look at where where the contractor is seeing uh, the most amount of of risk on a project. So uh, I can't stress enough how important it is for the localities to address those questions because it will allow uh, us to have some insight. Uh, and us to maybe reduce some of that money that we have in as as risk, and you know, consequently, the the locality get get better pricing. Okay. I don't see anything happening over here in the chat window, so we're going to keep going. I, I, we've talked about risk, and obviously, that's that's one of the things that y'all are. That's the the. The tightrope you're walking, um, if you will, as you're uh, submitting or preparing your bid for submission and ultimately trying to deliver a project. I uh, want to talk about um, risk allocation and and what I would view as um, maybe inequitable risk um, allocation from the standpoint. I think we've been kind of dancing around that. So there's a here again a theme here. Um, I know that. Uh, 
I want to delve into it a little bit more, though. Uh, some of those more risky um, kind of topics, if you will. Uh, I'm thinking utility and or right away or access um, restrictions or, or lack thereof, and and even further contract times. We talked about that. So let's talk about the, um, the those in inequitable risk allocations as they pertain to, let's say, um, utility work right now. How, how is it that y'all, you know, deal with that, approach that um, when we have either in plan or out of plan work? Sure. Um, you know, one of the bigger issues that we see on on projects is, uh, especially with respect to, you know, these urban projects with a lot of utility relocations. Uh, I think it's a big item of it's a big item of risk for us. Uh, but I think it's also a big item of risk for for the locality, you know, from claims and you know time and and those kinds of things. But uh, I think it's very important that uh, the localities spend the time to make sure, you know, number one that those those existing utilities are relocated. But uh, you know, typically what happens is. You know, there's either something that's unidentified uh, that we run into, or there's a, a cable line, gas line that is not relocated in in the right spot. And uh, you know, those those types of issues on projects, uh, you know, typically you know cost us a considerable amount of of time. Um, you know, when you consider how we how we plan the project and how we begin to execute the project, and then we run into utility conflicts, and uh, you know, it just it throws the whole whole project off. Okay, Mike. Yeah, I think uh, you know, Buddy hit on a lot. We typically see, I, I would say, and Buddy, you concur, chime in. But I, I think typically on all of our LEP projects. Mostly the water and sewer utilities are done by the municipality or the municipality owns them. Um, it's, I think probably what Buddy's hitting towards what I'm, what I'm gonna focus on here is the, is the dry utility work, the private utilities, um, power and gas and cable and phone and all of those stuff that's, uh, that's along our project corridors uh, everywhere you go these days and, and adding. Um, every, every day you see a new fiber optic line being put in the ground somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the designer that started the project designing five years ago did, did not pick up what's being put in the ground right now. Um, and I think that's probably where we find the most um, most conflicts with uh, with uh, you know what's been designed and put out in the in the uh, PB or IFB plan set. Um, you know, especially when you've got a, a project where you've got concurrent utility relocations going on or an overlapping utility um, relocation within within the project schedule, um, because you know if there's there's design conflicts that come into play because the they don't have the as builts done, for example, um, on where that utility is being relocated to, and it's just an approximate area, uh, unless you're going clearly off the right of way somewhere. Um, but typically, that's not the case in our urban settings, especially. Well, I know Mike and Buddy too that um, the, you know we we have an interactive system. Um, I think Buddy, you mentioned uh, the ability to answer, ask, and answer, receive answers to questions for clarity purposes as they relate to a proposal or IFB. I know that uh, we utilize a system that is. Um, Anyone can post questions to, and and we commit to providing answers up to the Friday prior to the bid submission um, deadline. We have a very rigid, if you will, schedule laid out a year in advance from a letting perspective. So, it, it, and we commit to if we have questions by that Friday, we are going to provide some clarity or some level of um, effort to provide. An answer of some sort, whether it be, hey, we, it's an error, we missed it, we'll have to work order it, or um, this is the, you know, the further clarity that we need. I know talking about utilities, though, that those in plan or out of plan, I know the out of plan utility questions we get a lot of because um, you, you uh, relocations may have taken place prior to, but the utility may have left poles in place, stuff like that, where, you know, we're providing answers because it looks like the utility's not there. Y'all are seeing it and and having to 
you know, if we're not giving you, we're able to give you an answer as to whether or not it's live or not live, um, you're going to have to price that risk into your bid. And if we can give that clarity prior to the bid submission, you can, you know, relieve your, us of that risk. Um, I know that that's one of the things that we do um, from our, you know, side of the house, if you will, um, as it pertains to, you know, asking questions and specifically regarding out of plan utility um, impacts. Uh, we're going to continue talking about the, the, that risk allocation, or even I'm using the word inequitable um, risk allocation. Um, one of y'all discussed a um, contract uh, time determine uh, you, you essentially how you know is it a calendar day? Is it a fixed completion day? Is does it have? I mean, one thing that came up yesterday, and I know we've had a number of questions about it, or is it might not even have a completion date. It's got a substantial date, no fixed completion date, um, which creates a situation where you you don't know when the project's going to end, and if it creates a situation, we've got some funding questions and, and payment questions later on that that I want to get to. But um, how the how those types of things impact you when you're looking at a project and and maybe um we've uh been extremely aggressive um and i say we as because we do a lot of work ourselves i know how vdot handles that if we have projects that that may um prompt uh an aggressive schedule or an accelerated schedule we have tools in our toolbox we use incentives and disincentives um pretty pretty regularly these days to to um I don't want to say accelerate a project, but but to to put a carrot out there for the contractor to to look at the date and and go okay here's the completion date, but if we can get it done earlier, we're going to get this you know this dollar figure per day maxed out at this dollar amount, and that that is a project cost, but at some point that convenience needs to be considered and factored in, to, in from the impact of the construction activities. So I'm gonna Mike, you want to take that first and. Yeah, sure. I mean, incentive disincentive clauses are, are uh, in my opinion, a a welcome addition to the contracts. Um, it gives is, it gives us opportunities to obviously, you know, we're we're for profit organizations. It gives us an opportunity to potentially increase our profit margin on a job. Um, but you know, the the value the value set plays into the plays into the equation. You know, if it's if it's a I don't want to be belittle it, but if there's a small amount, you know, you know we have to weigh that against the, the value of that against what what we might need to consider for acceleration costs to uh, accelerate the project. I, I welcome them. I, uh, I, I do personally. So. I know that that's a discussion that I have quite often. I mean, uh, I've seen a number of um, incentives come in from the from one of the nine, any of the nine districts, which, quite frankly, you know, when we're trying to um, not allocate a sufficient f amount of funds and we're talking about CEI savings or something like that and it's three fifty five hundred dollars a day it, it just at some point the juice isn't worth the squeeze to your point and it, it just it, it it it's not enough to overcome necessarily anything but you know you deal with some larger more high profile highly political projects where we're trying to accelerate that completion and we're talking you know fifty seventy five hundred thousand dollars you know on a thirty forty fifty million dollar job or more i mean i we've seen we've seen incentives in the millions on some design build projects and what and the like but um yeah, I mean, we're, we want to make sure that that if we're using that as a tool, that it that that we're getting what we you know the intended outcome. I think yeah, I, let me add on just a second. I would I would say I would I would ask that the consideration be there that if you're already under a, an aggressive time frame, the uh, the incentive clause to deliver it even earlier it, <laughs> is 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 uh, less palatable, so to speak. Sure. Buddy, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say that myself. I mean, the the incentive disincentive really needs to be be realistic, and uh, and you know, quite frankly, worth the price that it costs us to to accelerate a, a project. You know, if you know, it costs us two hundred thousand dollars to get extra people and equipment on a job, and we're getting a hundred thousand dollar incentive. You know, we're likely not gonna be able to do that um so i mean we just had we just had one uh harold that i know you're aware of uh, the, the monitor merrimack bridge tunnel where there was a pretty substantial 
uh, incentive to, to get that project done. Uh, you know, we had originally in the contract, we had four weekends uh, to, to do that project. Uh, but there was an incentive to get it done earlier. And, you know, it was a, a varying incentive depending on how early. But, uh, you know, we actually uh, were able to put the people and the resources together uh, to get it done in, in four weekends, uh, two weekends as opposed, uh, opposed to four. And uh, it worked out real well for us. VDOT didn't have to uh, have the road shut down two extra weekends, and uh, uh, it, it just it worked out really well. You know, and on top of that, there was a disincentive for us to, if we went beyond uh, the time closure each weekend. You know, so those those things were were all part of the consideration and uh, how we how we manned. And, resource the project. Well, I think, yeah, I think that those are great points. And I, I wasn't, I, I hope I didn't muddy the water. Let's be very clear. Incentives and disincentives are not, can be used as a tool. But um, if you have an aggressive schedule, um, they're not going to overcome an aggressive schedule. It may take a reasonable schedule uh, that, that has been put together with a contract time determination report to go, hey, look, this is what we've, this is the amount of time it's going to take. But to your point about the monitor Merrimack, maybe we go, hey, look, it's doable and you could do it faster. So if you can do it faster, we'll give you this extra payment for us, you know, depending on how quickly sliding scale. So that you can get very creative with those incentive disincentives from the standpoint of, um, you know, how you package it, if you will, and and, and structure it um, from that standpoint. Um, I'm looking at some questions that have come in. I uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. One of the questions we got in a, is in addressing questions and issues um, or, or issuing addenda or um, revisions. What is the ideal amount of time for getting that last addendum before the bids are due? I'm going to speak from VDOT's perspective, just so because Mike and Buddy are very familiar with this, and then I'd like to hear what they're seeing from locals, and then hopefully maybe we can get some feedback and 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 what level of expectation what what i can tell you is we our our lettings are wednesday um we have a major and a minor addendum deadline the the major addendum deadline is two fridays prior to the bid letting so it's just that simple uh, roughly not quite two weeks out um we cut it off and a major addendum for us is adding pay items if we're having to act, whereas at that point in time, that's the last opportunity the department has to add pay items that would require the contractor to here again, have to go solicit either more subcontractors or quotes from, from contract or from suppliers, whatever the case may be. And then our minor addendum deadline is really just that is the Thursday prior to the bid letting. So bid letting is Wednesday, the Thursday prior to that. Um, so just shy of a week, we can issue minor addendum. Minor addendum is clarity. You know, we've we're, we're just adding. You know, we we're not changing the material. You know, of the proposal from the standpoint of what is going to be required. Maybe we had some ambiguous language that we've clarified through the through CAB previously, so everybody was aware of what was being done and what was the expectation. But from a contract document standpoint, we wanted to add that you know, officially to the, to the language, if you will, um, trying to think of, I think that that kind of very high level covers it. Mike, buddy, do y'all, how do, I mean, I, I don't know what y'all are seeing from, from the uh, localities from the standpoint of, you know, are they trying, are we making um, changes? And, and I guess one of the key things here also is our Virginia public procurement act addresses this to some extent and, and how, you know, at what point is, is it too much of a change? To address, um, you know, from a reasonable expectation for the contractors to be able to process <laughs> the information, mm -hmm. buddy. Yeah, uh, you know, it's hard. That's a hard question to to really answer because it it all depends. I mean, I like I like VDOT system. If it's a minor change, it's the Friday before. If it's a major change, you have at least a week and a half to address those major changes. 
Um, you know, so I, I think that's a reasonable time frame. Now, you know, if if you do a full scale change of you know the drawings or the sequencing or or something like that, it may be too much for us to address even in a in a week and a half. So it really depends on the the size and scope uh, uh, of the change. Mike, you, you're the estimating expert. What what are your thoughts? Well, thanks for that uh, <laughs> plug. <laughs> that, that plug there, but but you know, yeah. I mean, it obviously. I mean, it's, it's commonsensical a little bit. Um, the, the more complex the change is, the the more time we need. Obviously, you know, as Buddy's mentioned earlier, you know, we we go full bore and 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 do quantity takeoffs on all the scope of the project. So if there's a major plan change where we have to, you know, essentially start over, you know, it it, it may be a, a, an extreme challenge you know, to to do a large earthwork project, for example, that you got to go back and start from scratch because the sequencing changed or you reissued the plan set. So. A lot of that plays into it. You know, I, I agree with what, what you're saying, what Buddy said. Uh, I, I like VDOT system. It's typically the, and enough enough time to deal with the majority of changes. Um, I have seen major changes a couple of days before the bid through through localities. Um, and when you do that, you know, we, we the theme here has been pretty consistent. You know, we have to assess the risk of the risk with it because at that point in time, if it's a two days before you issue a plan change, two days before the bid goes in, you're looking at uh, you know, we've already invested the time and and money into the pursuit. Um, we're not likely to back out unless it's just as you mentioned earlier, Harold. Just we we hit that threshold, then we've got to say no. We're just going to have to. Well, so, so, so Mike, along those lines of what you just said, you've already invested the time and money or the time and energy to, to chase the bid to that point. That change comes. You're still going to put a bid in. The expectation, though, is that bid's going to have some extra weight to it <laughs> to, to account for the for the inability for you to truly chase the, those changes to the extent that you're comfortable. Correct? Sure. Sure. And, you know, we're. You know, we're, we're talking about competitive bidding here, and you know we're contractors are are by nature competitive folks. So you know we we don't we don't go into a project looking to just to just submit a price. You know we want we want to win the project. We want we want to we want to win a successful project for for all parties. So it, we don't like adding money at the at the end of the day because of uh, the risk transfer that may happen. Buddy, do you want to add anything there? Kind of, I know we kind of added a little wrinkle there. No, no, I mean, yeah, I, I'll just mimic what what Mike said, and you know, we we have to if if we don't have enough time uh, to address a, a major change on a project, you know, we're invested, uh, you know, just like Branch would be. And, you know, we're going to address the risk and take the chance of putting the extra money, you know, in there if if, if we don't have time to adequately uh, look at the change. Okay, thank you. I'm looking, we've, we've got some questions coming in. I'm hoping that we um, get some more. Hopefully, this is stirring some, getting some people thinking. I, I encourage everyone to to be asking questions. If if we're on the fringe of something that that you know, a question that you may have for for a buddy or Mike, please feel free to you know to submit those. If you want to submit them to me directly and not to the entire group, please do so. Um, you'll have the anonymity. I'll just uh, read the question there. Um, looking. Uh, I've got a question here about we we're talking about utilities. Is there any consider has is there any consideration being given to requiring utilities to provide more details as to actual locations such as marker balls? I think that that's most of these utilities that we're talking about are private. Um, I know we VDOT have gone down that path in the past of trying, you know, tracer wire, uh, having worked for a locality in the past, we were trying to, you know, we want to know where our utilities are. I think everybody does. I know a lot of these areas that Mike and Buddy had talked about from the standpoint of maybe urban environments that are that have some age to them, they that you, you might have utilities on top of utilities and 
that some are live and some are abandoned in place and you've got all types of uniqueness and and uh complexity there um you know i think that that's really more of a utility question i, I do think from a utility owner standpoint I, I know that um at least when i was with us with the city and that was something that we actively tried to do so we knew the location um of you know i remember being on a job site and um having a 36 inch force our water line uh being mismarked by almost 20 feet and getting a little too close to it so we it is never a good thing um and uh, ultimately i think that that comes down to the uh private utility owners i do think that there is obviously a desire both from the department standpoint and the contractors the more we know the better they can prepare their bids and and more comp competition and the better prices quite frankly uh, Absolutely, Harold. I mean, and, you know, not to mention safety, right? Uh, you know, the more we know about those utilities in the ground, the safer our people will be, uh, the safer the traveling public will be. And, uh, you know, there, there's also the aspect of um, knowing uh, – knowing what utilities are live or not a lot of times those utilities get abandoned and you know we we run into them and you know we've been delayed for as much as a week waiting on a public utility uh, uh a utility company to come back and say oh that uh that utility is abandoned don't worry about it you know so uh you know no one knowing what's what's there and what's left there uh, after the utility companies do their relocations, it's key. And even to the to some point, even having uh, any information is critical. You know, you're, you're in some of these urban environments that are older. You could have hazardous material pipe. You could have old. I mean, you could have a lot of different things there that 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 play into how you're having to address materials as you're removing from site and so forth and so on. So the more, obviously, the more information we can give, the um, it goes back to that risk allocation. And, and here again, that making sure that it's an equitable risk allocation between the owner and the contractor. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I, I think that there's one question that came up, you know, specifically when we were talking around uh you know utility relocations and delays and uh i mean the question is after what point does a contractor consider filing a claim and i think that is a a huge uh issue for us to talk about uh and and get an understanding from from both sides on you know why we have claims and, and what prompts a claim. And, you know, the first point I'll make about that is, you know, when we, when we have something, whether it's a utility relocation that causes a delay, you know, we have a certain amount of time to notify uh, the locality of our intent to file a claim. So, I'll answer that question just by saying, as soon as we see an issue, no matter how minor or major it may be, we don't have a choice in, in how we administer that issue. And it, we have to say, we're reserving our right to file a claim. Now, and, that's pretty, and it's pretty well spelled out in our standards and specifications. We, we tell you what our expectation is from a claim perspective. Absolutely. And I mean, even even VDOT, where it's it's well spelled out, uh, you know, there it, it can cause, you know, some degree of contentiousness, uh, you know, between, you know, our field supervision and and VDOT's, you know, field supervision and, and you know, with the localities as well, you know, but, you know, from our standpoint, we really don't have a choice uh, in how we how we proceed when there is an issue. You know, we have to you know put VDOT or the locality on notice that this is an issue, and we're reserving our right to file a claim. 
Uh, it may go down the road a little ways, and we re recognize, hey, it really wasn't that big an issue. We could we could take this crew and put them here and have them work, and it, it really didn't affect us, you know. But if it does turn into a major issue, and we haven't filed those notices of intent, you know, we're out of luck. I think one thing just to, I know that this is a kind of, I don't want to say a Pandora's box, but one thing I, I, I guess to wrap that up to, um, I think that having that, that kind of process laid out, that helps you provide here again, competitive bids because you know you have an avenue to, to pursue. If something does come up, you can put us on notice and reserve that for until you understand the true impact. It very well may result in nothing. Um, but, but it, you, you know, from a risk here again, risk allocation standpoint, it, it, it doesn't absolve you, but it, it puts us on notice that there's could be something going on here that, that is putting the project in jeopardy in some manner, shape or form. That's correct. All right, I've got looking at we're starting to see some questions. Uh, but, but, but does VDOT release a list of contractors that are bidding on the project ahead of the bid due date? That is a yes, resounding yes. We that that helps um, uh, on a number of fronts. I, I think it, it I don't know that the prime contractors <laughs> necessarily um, I, I know that you're kind of seeing who's doing what necessary uh, in from a maneuvering standpoint. But uh, it, it is one of the things that I think that both uh, the prime and subcontractors utilize heavily from the standpoint of who they're going to be working with, subcontracting with, DBE participation, among other things. Buddy, so it's a resounding yes. We have a plan holders list. It gets updated once uh, once a week. So it's a running list that continually um gets updated until bid letting. So Mike, uh, buddy, y'all want to weigh in on how y'all use the plan holders list or view the plan holders list? Yeah, I, I'll, I would say I would encourage everyone to issue those. Um, so I know some don't, um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure, but you know, we use it from, a, from my perspective, estimating perspective, you know, I, there, there could be suppliers that are interested in a job that we don't necessarily deal with. Um, it might be a key supplier at the end of the day. So uh, sharing that information to where we can we can make sure we're reaching out to all the businesses that might be interested in the project and, and getting a getting a, getting a quote from them to provide materials or uh, scope of work on the project. I think it, I think it's key, buddy. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Harold. I mean, we we do use that. Uh... That bid list to, uh, you know, and we're not always a prime contractor either. Uh, you know, sometimes we're just quoting asphalt or aggregates or, or concrete, you know, so we use that list to, to, to target those folks that are, that are bidding a job. Uh, when we're bidding projects prime, we, we use that list to, to target subcontractors and, uh, you know, especially uh, DBE contractors. So ultimately providing, having that information, it, it could enable you to provide better bids, quite frankly, or more competitive bids, because um, for any number of reasons, supply, materials, so forth and so on. Absolutely. Um, I have a question here or a comment. Would providing utility relocation design plans provided by the private utility owner as part of the bid package provide some risk mitigation and be reflected in your bids? Uh, I mean, I, I would say yes, you know, it, it would provide some some level of risk mitigation. Uh, you know, we we're assuming uh, when we when we take a set of drawings that those utility relocations have been taken into account when. Uh, you know, when the drawings are uh, are done. You know, I, I think the the biggest issue with utility relocations are you know, is that you know sometimes they're just not where they say they are. That or the time they're they're not on schedule. <laughs> they're yeah, saying that they're, they're, yeah. they're going to be out of the way and they're not yet. <laughs> That's right, Mike. Yeah, I would I would uh, second what Buddy's saying. Yes, um, with a. A little bit of a caution there that you know we we rely on the data that's on the on the uh, the record set of plans. Um, that's what 
that's what our contract is based on. Um, that's, that's what's referenced in our contract documents and what, and what we're, we're held to. So I would, I would encourage that, uh, that as much, uh, effort and due diligence as the municipalities can, uh, can, uh, afford in the design development process to, to spend as much time vetting out those potential conflicts and issues with the design set, the record set of plans. All right. Thank you. Uh, keep this moving. I, I want to hit one more question over here. I know. Um, so I have a question regarding time frame competitive. The county advertises contracts for a minimum of 28 days and arranges a pre-bid meeting two weeks after the bid is advertised and accepts questions until a week before bid opening. Does this timeline encourage maximum bidder participation? I'm going to weigh in here and then I'm going to kick it over to Mike and um, buddy is, again, the, uh, what I, I would say, yes, a uh, week's getting a little, I mean, we, we provide answers up to the day. Like I said, the Friday, we have lettings on Wednesdays. We accept questions up to the Friday and I'm posting answers up to the morning of bid letting just as you know, based on timing. So I, just to try and get that information in their hands. Cause I know, um, and buddy and Mike can speak to this. First hand, um, you know, they don't like cha making changes up to the last minute, but here again, they want to be competitive and they are, they're putting a, bi a bid together to win the job. So, um, I know sometimes changes are happening. We, we get, we start reading or downloading bids at 10 01. Um, I, I'm, I've seen when bi some bids are coming in and they're at 958, 959. <laughs> um, so uh, I know that those changes can take place up to the last minute, at least for us and, and how we accept bids. Um, I think that that time frame's good. The pre-bid, I, I wanna talk about that for, for just, you know, we do showings or pre-bids. Um, we don't, we, we discourage um, them from the, from the standpoint of, unless we're, can, you know, the question I always, ask our districts in, in project development uh, folks that are putting together these packages, what are we trying to convey? What are, what is, what's the pre-bid about? Um, if we're having a pre-bid, we typically try and, um, you know, if it's that important, the question is, is it mandatory or is it non-mandatory? I'd be interested to know from the locality's perspective, if they're having non-mandatory showings, typically we don't get a lot of involvement because it's non-mandatory and everybody's busy doing other things. Um, but when you have a, when you require a mandatory, you're, you're, you could potentially be restricting competition because if they can't make it, then you, you lose a bit potential bidder. So I, that's kind of our, our approach. Um, buddy thoughts about pre-bid and. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, you know, for the most part, uh, a 28 day advertisement is, is sufficient. You know, I do know that, you know, depending on the size and complexity, you know, there are times where, where VDOT has a 60 day ad, you know, and that usually reserved for larger, more complex projects. So I, I think, you know, for the most part, 28 days is, is fine and questions up till a week, uh, before bidding, bid opening are fine, you know, as long as those don't, those questions don't prompt some, you know, you know, big addendum, big complex uh, change to to the project. You know, I will say, you know, one of the one of the good things that VDOT does is we get a lot of visibility into their their bidding schedule even before the advertisement date. You know, we know for the most part you know, what, what projects are coming up in what district with, uh, you know, a pretty close, uh, advertisement date. Uh, and some of the, some of the localities are, are better at doing that than others, but, uh, you know, it, more transparency into, uh, the overall program that, uh, that, each of the municipalities or localities has, you know, can help us, you know, kind of balance our, our workload uh, and, and better, better respond to bids that are, that are coming up. So I, I'd encourage, uh, you know, the localities to, 
to be as transparent as possible when it comes to their their pipeline of work, you know, as as a whole. Uh, a lot of times, you know, something will be bid and then 30 days or something will be advertised that we didn't know about. And then 30 days later, we got to bid it, you know, so uh, more transparency into your entire program for a year or two years, three years, five years, uh, you know, w- would help a contractor. Well, I think that also that that plays into how you're scheduling your work. Correct. I mean, you know, you might that gives you the ability to 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 say, yeah, I want to based on your existing workload or capacity, you know, one this project, you know, you need to keep your crews working. But long term, this project might be a stretch for you and might be a little more aggressive than you'd like to be. If you knew another project was coming 45 days or 90 days down the road, it gives you about a better ability to project workload from a capacity standpoint for your company. Correct. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the opposite is true, too. You know, we may know there's a big job that's coming up that better suits our, our company. So we're going to skip uh, we're, we're going to skip the next two smaller jobs that would eat up resources so that we can better compete on uh, on that larger job that suits us better. Mike, Mike. no, I buddy hit it on the head, um, you know. It's it, we're all dealing um, from a contractor standpoint, you know, dealing with a, a reduced resource pool. But, you know, we we need to we I focus a lot on balance and how the project fits within our our current uh, backlog schedule um, a lot in my decision making. So, you hit it on the <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm looking. We've got some. I've got. I'm getting some some folks sending me stuff. I, I guess to wrap up, um, kind of this component, we were talking about risk as they talked about utilities, contract times. One thing that I wanted to to kind of stress and and kind of put out there, and we talked about it yesterday uh, from from our perspective. Um, you know, one com- important component as it relates to schedule, overall contract times and and potentially having insufficient contract time durations. Um, You know, one thing that that I guess could you speak to just uh, briefly regarding um, the importance or how you view having, you know, essentially an approved baseline schedule and how that, you know, from a schedule impact standpoint, um, you know, having that information or that that knowledge going into bidding. Mike, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, typically what we've been seeing, you know, the trend in the last, especially the last five years, and Harold, I'm, you'll probably hopefully agree with what I'm about to say. Um, the overall project schedules, uh, Keep getting compressed um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I know there's there's funding constraints or other things that play into it from the delivery side of things. And, you know, we're, we're timing projects to deliver corridors at the same time across several different contracts. Um, having a, a good handle on the overall project schedule um, is paramount to what I do. Um, and, and together my bids is I, I have to, I have to look at it from start to finish and say do we have enough time what if, if we've got a compressed schedule you know do I need to look at how we're going to phase the project um, night work are we allowed to work nights you know, some projects we're not even allowed to work nights because of the location of the project noise ordinances and, and other things that come into play there so so I'm going to ask a question, Mike, and follow up to that. I mean, are you seeing? I mean, when you're getting, when you're, when you're winning, being successful on local projects, are you seeing baseline? I mean, are when you walk into that, you know, you've won the job, and you're walking into it. Um, the schedule that that was communicated, it did it, was it backed up with some baseline schedule or CTDR or something along those lines, or are you walking into something that really was never evaluated, quite frankly, and it was just a date. I, typically, what what we see coming from the localities, um, there's not much backup in how the time frame was established. 
lay it like that. Um, we branch as, a, as an organization has a policy to, to do a, a, a a schedule for every bid that we put out the door so we can understand the, our risk associated with the overall schedule of the project. Um, so when we'll ask questions um, based off of our our analysis of, of the time frame for the job, and that's and then we get we we adjust based off the answers we get back from the municipality. So if, it, if it's a hard date, and and I understand that you know there's constraints put across across the board for a lot of reasons. Um, but you know, the, if I could go back 20 years ago, I would say we used to have a whole lot more time to build jobs back 20 years ago than we do these days. That's for sure. <laughs> and it certainly impacts uh, impacts sure. our decision making from every step of the way. All right, buddy. Yeah, there's actually there's actually a question. The, the yeah. last question asked was about calendar day of fixed completion date contracts as it relates to. Um, you know, punch list acceptance, and um, yeah, that I mean that whether it's calendar day or or fixed completion date, we're we're probably we're seeing more fixed date completions than we are calendar day completions. But uh, you know, that is a that is a great great question and can be a huge item of contention, you know, between contractors and the locality and. Uh, are we going to are we going to charge liquidated damages? You know, while we're while we're trying to get everybody on board, the locality V dot and the contractor with what needs to be done on a punch list, or you know, should we should we look at substantial completion and that you know, you, the roads being used for its intended purpose while we're while we're trying to get through the uh, the issue of, of punch list? So. Um, you know, I can tell you that, uh, you know, we, we consider those types of issues in our, our bids and our experience level with that, that municipality, uh, and how well we get through a punch list, uh, and, you know, what the flexibility is with, with liquidated damages, uh, you know, because we've 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 quite honestly been been burned a couple of times and, you know, we've finished the project, but we've waited, you know, a month to get punch list work done, you know, because everybody's trying to agree on what what the punch list is. And then only to find out that, you know, during that month we've been charged liquidated damages. So, uh, you know, we might get burned once, but we're not going to try not to get burned twice. Mike, I don't know if you had anything to add. If not, I'll, I'll say the other thing. The other thing that that is a, a consideration within the you know the calendar day versus fixed completion date is weather. Um, weather has an impact on our work every day. Um, if you know, if we can't pave, you know, <laughs> if we get but buddy buddy understands the, the paving specifications. There's just some days you just can't get out there and pave. You know. But, you know, when we sign a fixed completion date contract, that, you know, it, it, the date is what the date is, and we have to assess the risk associated with that. So, um, yeah, we, we like we like to understand, uh, you know, that we're whether we can't control. We all we all know that, and um, I particularly personally like calendar day contracts better. But I would say more and more and more, we're seeing ninety percent plus being fixed date contracts. And those bring a risk. Yeah. And Mike brought up a good point too, especially on calendar date completions. And you know, we really need to look at when those completion dates are, because usually on a road project, the last thing to happen is the surface asphalt and uh, and the striping. You know, so to have a fixed date completion that is January or February isn't going to be real realistic when you know we've got a uh, 40 degree and rising uh, temperature spec limitation on uh, surface asphalt. So, uh, you know, details like that really, really need to be looked at when uh, when you're establishing that that completion date and, uh, you know, the timing of of certain items work. 
Well, it, along those lines, I know some things that we do internal to VDOT as a, as a using just those tools in our toolbox from the standpoint of um, talking about completion dates. And we do we use fix, com, fixed completion dates. We do uh, get creative, though, however, and I mean, we've done A plus B contracting. Now, that's not very frequent, but we have done that um, one that we do use a tool that we use a lot more frequently and and um, especially when the market I don't want to say the market's saturated, but when we have a lot of work going on, um, we use dual date contracts quite a bit. Uh, I don't know, Mike, buddy, if y'all have an opinion or feel about dual date contracts and and how um, how well they work for you. Um, We we haven't had much experience with the A plus B contracts, to be honest with you, uh, Harold. Sure. I don't know if you have Mike. I, I've I've done quite a few. I mean, there's there's pluses and minuses for for all of those things. I mean, we, we can talk about pros and cons all day, but you know, A plus B contracts, for example, um, some contractors like them more than others. You know, but that's you know you're. At the end of the day, you're putting a dollar value on that day, right? Um, in in consideration of the bid, so it, it it may force some people to make decisions to be more aggressive or not aggressive, depending on the overall time frame. Um, so it, it has an impact on the competitive competitiveness of the bid itself. We haven't used a lot of the A plus B. The last project that I'm aware of that we did A plus B on was Southgate um, project out in Salem. Uh -huh. I remember <laughs> um, the the uh, dual date. I don't know if y'all maybe y'all haven't seen or or chased many of those projects um, for us, but those are essentially where we uh, stipulate a number a fixed number of days allowed for a project, but give you essentially a sliding scale to to you pick your start date. The end date is here. You have X amount of days to get the work done. You you fit it. You, let's say it's 90 days worth of work and you have a year to do that. You pick your start date and finish date as long as it isn't beyond the fixed completion date as stipulated. So it gives you a little bit better ability to fit that into your workload rather than our schedule, you know, our maybe artificial schedule. Yeah, we haven't had any experience with that, but it, yeah. It gives us some flexibility for sure. I don't have much experience with that, you know. It. Just speaking from, I mean, we've seen we've we've um, we've had a couple jobs that we've had to. Quite frankly, we brought bids in and either didn't receive bids or had to reject bids because the bids were extremely high. When we've repackaged them and given flexibility to the um, to the to the, I guess, when the window of work would be completed, we've. Um, increased our competition, uh, competition exponentially in some instances and seen bids that were very competitive because you don't ever know, you know, somebody might be working in that area, but can't do the job because of their current, you know, ca capacity, but they have that job, you know, they have a job nearby wrapping up that they could, if, if you could move that wind, that start window 45 or 60 or 90 days, it, it could uh, become, you know, a, a, a very, um, positive interaction because they're already essentially on site they're literally uh right. possibly they're already mowed to the area or something along those lines we've seen very good success um in those regards uh we'll want to wrap up this kind of con top this topic if you will um we talked about um a lot of different things over the last hour or so one of the components that i wanted to address is uh decision making um Mike and Buddy, you you kind of hit on it, Buddy, when you were talking about the um, the calendar day to fixed date as it re related to the punch list. Um, I know that that's just one component of it, but from a decision making standpoint, um, I know I've heard a lot of feedback from from contractors over the years about you know who's empowered to make decisions. I know a lot of localities um, uh, rely on external resources consultants to, to perform some duties on their behalf. Um, having clear, open communication lines from the standpoint of who is responsible, who is who can make those decisions at that time, and it not have being deferred to some later time or indefinitely. 
can you talk about um, that at all? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing, you know, from, from all the different localities that we, that we work with, I mean, we see a varying degree of, uh, I guess, timeliness of, of decisions. And, uh, you know, you touched on it, Harold. I mean, open communication between the contractor, uh, the project engineer for the locality, whether it's, you know, uh, a consultant engineer or, or somebody that works for the locality. And those those quick decisions, uh, depending on what the issue is, but, uh, I mean, in most cases, uh, you know, quick decisions, uh, you know, help keep the, the job moving along, you know, decrease the amount of delays that that we have you know we've seen in some cases where you know that engineer makes that decision and it and it's pretty transparent to us we've seen in other cases where those engineers are uh you know not either not able or not willing uh to make the decision and you know it it, it seems to get go through this big bureau bureaucratic uh you know, cycle that, that takes time. Um, so. And I'm going to be frank, buddy. What, what, when that, when that's happening, what is that, where does that leave you? I mean, you know, that leaves us with juggling our schedule, juggling our resources. Uh, you know, if, if it affects something, you know, on, on the project, that, uh, you know, we, that is critical to the critical path. You know that that can really affect our schedule uh, negatively. Mike, no, he's buddy hit it again. Um, we're typically, you know, we're we're starting to see a, a lot more, uh, you know, consultants involved with managing projects and things like that, and you know, authority levels and you know how the municipality sets it up and what, what authority level the construction manager may have, or, you know, the, the, the more layers in the process, the, the harder it is for us to, uh, to get through those, those kind of issues. And, you know, our, our goal is always the same. It's, you know, our most successful projects are ones where decisions, the majority of the decisions are made at the project level. Um, as you, as you've got to escalate up through the process, the time takes longer. And, you know, we're, Sitting there, uh, trying, to, trying to figure out where to go. In the meantime, for decisions made. Okay. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about it, and I think that that uh, just to wrap that up. I think that that ultimately gets into that timely conflict resolution and claims avoidance because those types of things, those decisions being made at, a, at the lowest level possible and as quickly as possible. I know we had claim discussion earlier about when y'all decide or when you know not making timely decisions kind of forces your hands potentially in in having to to decide whether or not you're going that route or or need to protect your interest. Yeah, and and you know we we understand too. I mean, to to the question that uh, came out of Northern Virginia, you know, we recognize that there there are some extra you know bureaucratic steps that need to be taken with locally administered projects, you know, and you know we understand that there may be design changes and things that need to occur, you know, in in those cases where you know it's it's clearly. Uh, an add to the project, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we adequately, adequately address the time factor of the delay and, and the change in the work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say a, a suggestion might be, you know, I would, I would encourage uh, all the municipalities when they're doing when you're doing your uh, overall time frame for the project to anticipate some of that stuff because you know it. I don't know, buddy, if you ever built a job where we didn't have an issue come up some form or fashion on a job. Um, not to be smart, but you know it, things are going to come up. It's construction. It is what it is. Um, you just you're going to have to anticipate some of that. some some stuff you'll never be able to anticipate. But you know, you, you, I would I would encourage to take some of that into into account. But you know there. There's probably might be a you know 
couple of plan plan revisions that need to happen through a project and account for that in the schedule. Yeah, I agree, Mike. I mean, it's never a job that goes by that doesn't have some sort of issue, right? I'm I'm still looking for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the unicorn, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, one year I've been looking. <laughs> well, I want to shift gears um, to uh, to kind of the the budget side of the house from the standpoint of how how projects are managed, how y'all are having to approach um, the constraints, or um, I don't want to say constraints, but but the stipulations as in, as um, laid out in in an IFB or proposal. Um, We'll kick this off with a retainage question. This was one of the questions we asked yesterday, a poll question. We didn't get a lot of responses. Um, we had, uh, the question was very specific. Do you allow, do you hold retainage on federal aid contracts? And the answer was no, or yes for, uh, and the answer of nine came back for yes and 23 said no. Um, to kind of kick off the discussion or the topic uh, of funding and budget issues, can, how, how do y'all, uh, we so just to make it clear um yesterday we made it, it, it very clear to uh, i hope it was very clear that re retainage isn't allowed on um federal aid contracts and actually is prohibited in um the through the local assistance manual on state funded um projects as well so uh but i know that we do see we see in, in ifbs that come through for approval we do see kind of uh retainage language incorporated into the contract uh we try and catch it and pull it out but i mean we do see that happening can it shouldn't be in most instances but some locally funded projects that maybe y'all are chasing does have retainage um can you talk about uh mike can you can you elaborate i guess how you view retainage and how y'all price that from a risk standpoint and, and they'll be top you know obviously we'll we'll keep going with the money kind of concept there um once we address this kind of thought process for the retainage sure i'll i'll, I'll, I'll kick it off with a, with a short statement contractors don't like retainage <laughs> um uh, we understand the reasons, you know, that that it may be included. I would say these days, uh, there's there's a few municipalities that we work in that that still do it. Um, they they handle their own funding mechanism. They have they have their own funding, their own their own program. Um, typically, um, the cost of money is out there. You know, when when we're providing a bond, I I look at it. We look at it as a contractor when we're providing a P and P bond. And then you hold retainage, you know, that there's a reason why you have a payment bond and, and, and a performance bond to start with. Um, I have seen instances where uh, uh, an owner has requested even more than that, you know, letter of credit on top of that. When you're looking at a 10% retainage, um, you know, where we don't get paid typically until the retainage does get released or uh, we may not get until the punch list is done or the, the final estimate, so to speak. You know, that, that's a we run we run on tight margins. That's a that's a pretty good chunk of change that, that we held on. Essentially, could be our entire profit on the job. So I would, contractors don't like retainage. So. Well, I guess I'll just, leave it Let Buddy chime in. <laughs> sorry, Buddy, you go ahead. I got a follow up question for you, Mike. If Buddy doesn't have it, okay. Yeah, I mean it's redundant, really. Uh, you know, retention is. You know, when you consider that you're paying uh, whatever percentage, you know, the contractor's bond rate is, you're, you're, the, the contract uh, is, is paying that amount for that bond. And, uh, you know, really our, our margin is, is where we would capture any extra cost of, of retainage and what the cost of that we anticipate the cost of that money to be for however much retainage is going to be left out there for however long, you know, in some, some localities uh, that do charge retention are, are better than others at, you know, getting that punch list done, getting the project closed out and getting us the money, but others are not. And, uh, and really it's a, it's an unneeded expense for, for the locality when they have the protection of the payment bond or the performance 
I guess the the so we've already to cover that just you know we've already got a, a performance bond that that addresses this to to a certain extent. Um, the, the the margins typically on a competitive job, or sometimes your margins aren't are maybe less than the compa- than the retainage that's being being withheld in in some instances. Um, the, I guess the long and short of it is you have to account for that um, that uh, float, if you will, um, in some manner, shape, or form, and typically that's going to result in in higher bid prices. Correct. That is correct. That's correct. So, um, and it's at some point, if we're already getting the performance bond, the question is, what are we at some point? What are we actually after? And, and are we or is it worth the extra cost to, to be able to say we've held retainage? But when, in fact, we already had a bond that, that in, in term in, in no, sh- you know, short terms really does the same thing. I mean, it, it is a piece of paper, but we, we go through a fairly lengthy process to to back that up if you will and there are always issues we covered some of those yesterday we've had bad experiences we talked about yesterday performance and and non-performance by a contractor and and uh you know we've we vdot have experienced some situations where we've had a default by a contractor we drew on the bond the bond defaulted (laughs) so i mean you know you could have perfect storms but the reality is that it's about it's a it's assistant essentially insurance policy and and we're already getting that so the retainage is is just extra on top which which makes you inflate have to inflate your price prices your unit prices or lump sum price whatever the case may be that's correct all right um i'm kind of i've got some notes here So let's let's talk about your experience as as it relates to those project budgets. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit and how they influence at least how you're seeing the management of the project. Mike, you want to take that one? How much time do we got left? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, there's varying degrees of of implementation of 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 the project budget. I mean, everybody understands, um, all parties involved understand that, you know, that the project, all these projects that we do are expensive. You have a, you have a limited amount of funding that you're available to do. You've got a big program that you want to do, but you don't have the money to do it. And you're obviously trying to manage against that. I have seen personally, you know, the trend from my perspective has been a, a lot of decisions being made off of, um, lack of a better way to put it completely on the amount of monies and budget um, to, to do the job or how the project how it has specification interpret or consideration for a time impact and out time impact on the job things like that you know do we have the money to do it and you know it, there's an interpretation thing there that you know everybody's got their own uh, perspective and, and what's important there um, budgets drive all of our decisions you know from the owner's perspective and the contractor's perspective you know, if we do a lump sum contract, you know, we we got a budget we got to manage against too. You know, as far as our production and what and where our price is, you know, everybody understands that we're on the same page there. I I, I can see I see different interpretations and different implementation across the board of how how that's uh, how that affects the decision making day to day. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Mike. Um, you know, the one thing that we don't want to see happen is you know quality suffer because of of uh, uh, a but budget budget constraints, so you know I think it's it's crucial that you know there are real realistic expectations as we go into projects and uh, set out those budgets and you know the contingencies uh, you know that are that are included in in the budget process. I mean, you know, Mike and I were just talking about you know we we've, we've never seen a job that goes exactly as planned. And, uh, you know, so there's always going to be something that affects the project and it can consequently affect the budget. I guess um, just in follow up on this one, and I, I, I feel like I'm going to be kind of repetitive here because I think that the, the want to drive, I'm trying to drive a point home 
because y'all y'all have long term you know you got your memory's good and when you work with a local you know let's be frank if you're working at, and i see it across district lines i'll be honest when, when, from a vdot perspective when we see bids come in from one district to another you can see sometimes how that affects from what you know from one just literally from an imaginary line so i'm going to ask the question you know the reality is when you have those decisions being made and 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 depending on how aggressive they're being made you're going to have to take that into account the next time you're considering a project or, or submitting a bid in that municipality or locality. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we look at every aspect and, and our history with the municipality plays a lot into our, our thought process. Um, like when we talk about payment and those kind of things, you know, you take all these items, put them together and, you know, we, we, that's part of our risk assessment and, and understanding what effect that may have on our price at the end of the day. Buddy? No, if yeah, you I mean, I agree with that. It, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, a lot of different inputs that we take, uh, you know, when we're bidding a, a project for any of the localities, you know, our relationship, you know, how well we feel like they, they work with, with contractors, uh, you know, and it can get down to the inspector level. It, you know, we, like you said, we've got long memories, and we we know uh, we know good ones, we know bad ones, and uh, you know, sometimes our our price is reflected in you know in those aspects as well. But uh, it all it all comes down to yeah, I think that we we talked about it a, a couple different times. Uh, the communication on a project and, you know, the, the ability for us as contractors to understand what, uh, what that loca locality is going through and what some of the key touch points are for them, whether it's budget or time, uh, performance, payment, you know, and, and the same is true from the locality standpoint. They've got to understand what really drives the, the contractors, you know, from all those those different aspects. Uh, and we talked a lot about risk and, you know, where are those risk items and, you know, how are we affecting those risk items when we change a project or, um you know, what are, what are the consequences of us taking six months to close out a job and get their attention to them? You know, so it's it's a lot of different aspects that that we consider. But I think a lot of those aspects, you know, can be be addressed if there's proper, uh, you know, communication on the project and an understanding of of each other's um, uh, motivations and touch points. All right. I think, but what you just said is, I mean, we need to remember that it is a relationship, and um, we both have a have a um, role in that relationship, and and can impact the other greatly in in decisions um, being made or not being made, or how we're uh, you know handling those individual circumstances. So I think that, that that's, I mean, well said. I guess I want to start kind of wrapping up here. I, we started talking about payment. Um, I want to talk about a couple of components of that, and I'm going to kind of throw them out there, and hopefully we can continue doing what we've been doing it, from prompt payment to payment terms, um, whether that be, you know, really what we're talking about is the cost of money and um, whether or not here again, are we asking the contractor to take on an undue burden necessarily from the from a payment perspective and and withholding till you know for six months or while we're punch listing something or or I, I in in conversations this uh, from a payment term perspective paid if paid paid when paid uh, clauses um, I'm understanding that there's that they're getting slipped into some some uh, local projects. Uh, and um, wanted to kind of reiterate the prompt payment component, but I wanted to hear again. I know that this has been kind of repetitive. The first part of this was fairly unique, but from, ultimately you're out there um, performing work for these localities and municipalities and the state um, DOT getting this work done. Um, and uh, here again, we know margins can be tight and the more competition, the tighter the margins. 
but we, we so we really need to have a good understanding in it of of the impact to some of these these clauses and and not paying promptly, quite frankly. And, and that is a requirement in the um, as laid out in the local assistance manual prompt payment. And we we try and do the same thing. It's it's a, it's actually a code requirement. So, Mike, do you want to take this first? Uh, sure. Um... I know it's a big ball of wax. <laughs> that's a, I mean, it, that's a, you know, we work, we work for money. We're, we're a for-profit organization, and uh, you know, it, that's that's what puts uh, food on our tables, and uh, you know, it, it keeps all of our employees uh, coming to work every day. And when when we don't have that money in our bank account, you know, we've got to pull from other other sources to to keep the business flowing. Um, when you know, retainage has an effect on it. You know, that's a that's like that's a cash in hand thing. As an example, that you know, if you're if you're holding out ten percent of the contract value in retainage, that's a lot of money. It could be sitting in, it's not in our bank account. You know, on costs we've already expended. That's so we're we're financing, so to speak, um, that extended uh, cash payment. So it's. Cost of the cost of money comes into into play, and like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of a history. You know, the history of the of, of our working with each municipality and their history of payment and um, paid if paid. I have seen. Um, I'll, I'll hit on that real quick. I've seen it in a few municipality contracts, especially in the last year or two. Paid if VDOT pays it, for example. You know, we'll we'll pay you for that if VDOT pays, it. or when you get on a job and so. I, there's a change, a change in conditions that's 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 compensable, but I'm I don't have the money as the municipality. I'm I can only pay you if VDOT pays me. Uh, so that that goes into that goes into the equation. We we understand the the funding aspects, especially on these projects, when you bring especially bring the state and federal government into into play as well, and the, and the bureaucracy and the, and the process goes along with it. And you know, the, the longer that time frame ex, extends, you know it. It can be quite impactful to us, and in our history with with, with municipalities and the delivery and the, and the layers within the funding mechanism, you know, we we have to take that into account early on. Yeah, and, and, you know, unfortunately, we're we're seeing a, a disturbing trend, you know, in in our our contracting. I mean. We work. We work for VDOT. You know, we can pretty much set our watch by when the, when the check is coming. Um, you know, depending on the locality. I mean, we are seeing extended uh, payment terms out there. You know, it can run anywhere from forty five to to sixty days. And uh, you know, to Mike's point, we are we are for for profit organizations, and you know, we. We typically have to finance, uh, you know, the first half to three quarters of our our year, you know, before you know we really get uh, cash positive. So um, those those delays in payment, you know, set that back even even further. Okay, I see. I, I saw a question come in. Um about the asking contractors at the beginning uh, obviously always we're you know there's a level of expectation that the contractor and and i think that goes without saying that we're anticipating and expecting you folks um in industry and and mike buddy to throw y'all under the bus on here to be doing what what you're obligated to do i, I see i mean y'all y'all should be able to see that yeah this went to everyone uh, we, we've got no leg to stand on if we're not meeting our contractual applications for for, right. for, for, for getting, and, and getting just, that payment. <laughs> just to be clear that was one of the things that we covered yesterday that that retainage um is allowed by our specs when you fall behind um schedule quite frankly when you're not performing um retainage is allowed in accordance with our standards and specifications that being said once you recover payments do um and uh so th that's one of those things that that should be clear um all right i was getting ready I, these, these we're getting some questions here that are good what, uh, so let's get y'all's thoughts on um i'm going to throw in an extra Bid additives and alternates. Where what are y'all 
where y'all fall on that and and how do y'all uh, i don't i don't know i don't know necessarily approach i think approaching is pretty straightforward how do you view additives and all alternates on a, on a bid risky um from a bidding perspective um they can be risky i say that you know it not knowing whether or not a portion of the scope is going to um, be performed um, or the scope may be removed or, you know, a, it's very difficult, can be very difficult to, you know, a, a figure into the schedule, the time frame. you know, if a, if a piece of work is going to be added or not, how does that affect the overall schedule? We may be able to do it cheaper if you say, hey, it's not going to be in there or, or vice versa. Um, conversely, you know, we you know, typically our, our job overhead and the expense, our general expenses on project may be, you know, that's built into the other items um, within the bid. And if an additive bid is is at risk of not being let, you know, it, where, where does that, are we going to end up in a, in a potential hole at the end of the day for our overall expenses? So, Mike, I'm going to throw, before Buddy weighs in, I'm going to throw in, so we talked about, add. Uh, we just talked about additives and alternates. I'm going to throw in allowances. Does that change the same deal? Yes. Um, <laughs> I understand the reasoning behind the allowances. Um, what I typically see is they're, they're too low. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, I look at it the same way as, it, you know, as a, as a responsible uh, contract. You know, we're going to include the amount that you say you want in that bid. And not a yard of dirt or a, a ton of stone more um, to include that. Um, so yeah, we look at it that way. The alternates or the, the allowances are are not as risky to us, in my opinion, because you've got you you know something's there. Um, I would say that if you if you're my advice to any of the municipalities, especially the procurement managers, and that if you're going to put an allowance out there, make sure you've got some contingency somewhere, um, unless you're absolutely positive that there's no way you're going to go above that allowance because that's where we, typically we run into issues is when we're going to go over the allowance. Thanks, Mike, buddy. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, I, I think bid additives and, and alternates are, are good when, it, when completely necessary. Uh, but to Mike's point, I mean, we're, they, they can get risky for us and whether we're going to do those alternates or not. How does often, how, how does that factor into the award, you know, the bid award on the project? You know, that sometimes that's, that's not, not completely clear. Um, you know, so I think, you know, there's, there's a time and a place, but I, I think it, you know, should be limited to those times when it's completely necessary. Okay. Well, I, I, with that, I, I'm going to encourage. We got, we're, we've got a, just about 15 minutes left. I don't want to go up to the wire here. I, I do want to. I'm going to give uh, both Buddy and Mike an opportunity to kind of make some closing remarks or statements. If anybody wants to get some more questions in, please feel free. I can't thank Buddy or Mike enough for their time this morning, giving us some insight. Um, I view these two individuals as subject matter experts. They are part of our industry that helps set our marketplace. And um, I, I can't thank them enough for taking out some time this morning and sharing their perspectives, their insights, their their opinions as as it um, relates to how they're approaching our both VDOT and locality or municipality work. So thank you both very much. Um, Mike, do you have any closing statements or thoughts or, you know, uh, yes, I, I mean, I really appreciate the uh, the candor today. Um, it's been uh, it's been an hopefully helpful to the to the folks on the call um, to at least give, you know, this is our perspective, my perspective as a contractor. It's, you know, I, we're, we're not perfect, but, you know, as as we work through this and, and, and work as partners with each individual municipality and, and, and all of our partners read out as well, I really appreciate the opportunity to sit in front of you guys and and have a conversation about this kind of stuff because I think this is an this is along the lines of what Buddy was talking about earlier. Some open communication amongst the amongst the parties to make sure we're all doing the right thing to deliver the projects um, that we all want and deliver successful projects. So appreciate the time and the uh, and the invitation. Thanks, Mike. Buddy. Yeah. Thanks, Harold. Um, you know, I'll say you know first off, I I, I really do appreciate the time. 
uh, being here and the ability to get in front uh, of all the different folks that are here uh, and, and talk about our business. I, I think you know, the one thing that, that we all share, uh, you know, besides the basics in life, but, you know, from a work perspective, you know, we all, we all share that desire to build, uh, you know, quality projects, you know, in, in our, in our neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, I, I, I believe, I truly believe that, that, you know, a lot of issues, no matter what they are, can be solved by, you know, the relationship that uh, that we have with each other. And that's, you know, you know, my 500 folks that, that work for us uh, and, and your folks that, that work for you uh, in each of your localities and, and how well they interact with each other. Uh, the the understanding uh, of what what drives a locality and the understanding of what drives a, a contractor don't don't always uh, match up but I, I think it's important that we have that understanding uh, of each other so that you know we can build successful projects that uh, you know that serve the, the taxpayers well um, I will say, you know, from all all the partner localities, uh, VDOT, you know, all the localities and VDOT, the, the folks that we work with, you know, we we truly appreciate your your business, and uh, you know, we we want to keep doing more and more of it, and uh, I, I really appreciate the time uh, to sit here and, and talk to talk to all of you, and I appreciate all the great questions too. I think. Uh, you guys provided some some great insight into um, and some of the questions that were asked. So, uh, Harold, thanks for giving me the opportunity uh, to get in front of everybody. I, I really appreciate it. No, I, like I said, I very I value your input, your opinion, our relationship working together. And and um, Mike and buddy can't thank you enough. I we do have ten minutes. I I don't. I'm not necessarily ready I, unless y'all y'all are ready to go. We've gotten some great comments, and I know Michaela is going to come on, and I, Russ might even have some closing statements or comments. Um, I know that the there isn't a presentation, but I do believe that the chat will be made available. But while we still have some time, one of the things that I, I had a couple fallbacks, and I don't. I hate to let 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 you go quite frankly buddy Mike just because it, this is an opportunity that doesn't we I mean I don't know when the last time this was done and I look forward to uh, us maybe having a larger group and being in person at some point in the future um, to be able to do this more and, and have a little more interaction um, we we talked about funding and budgets and whatnot uh, one of the poll questions that we asked yesterday when Karen and I were presenting um, was whether or not localities released budgets for projects when the project went out to add. And I was a little surprised. Um, most said uh, the, most were the, the answer. I don't want to say was resounding. No, but uh, we had 13 say yes and 28 say no. So two thirds essentially said they do not release um, any type of budget or uh, project funding, you know, perspective on a project, just from our perspective, when we issue an advertisement report, as Buddy and Mike both know, um, we're publishing a loaded construction number. It's actually the number from the six year plan that's in our, you know, long range um, program that uh, is is publicly available. So it's something that that's available to you if you sought it out, but rather than make you seek it out, we're being very upfront and transparent, giving that to you. Um, what I got yesterday from from some of the localities, like I said, almost looks like two thirds to a third are not providing that information. How does that impact y'all's um, y'all's approach when you're looking at a project? Does that a, does that uh, negatively impact your ability to even? I mean, one of the reasons we do it is so you can kind of very quickly gauge. Hey, look, this is the this is the the kind of round number where we're at um, to whether or not you want to chase it. Is it a million dollar job? Is it a ten million dollar job? Just at a very face, you know, very quick face value, um, looking at it on a on a on a report with very limited information. 
Uh, you hit it on the head, Earl. That's the first thing I look at is, you know, it, what's well, nobody's asking for your engineer's estimate and give, tell me exactly what you think the project's going to cost. But, you know, it's uh, it's all right. What's what's what size of project is it is the scope? It's, it goes quickly into the decision, helps us make the decision quicker. Um, understand, you know, whether or not the project's going to fit for us or not. You know, we're we're a, a larger contract, one of the larger contractors in the state. You know, some of those projects we might pass on, it, you know, to, if it as a quick glance looks looks to be on on the smaller side for us. You know, it, so it, it it helps us a lot in the decision making up front. Has less impact on the back end once we decide to go forward. Buddy? Yeah, I agree. I agree with that too, Harold, uh, with what Mike said. You know, but it also, you know, we can help uh, help you all as, as well. I mean, you know, I know Harold, you've gotten a couple calls that say, "Hey, you've got this job out here, and it's a ten million dollar job, but there's no way you're going to get it done for ten million. And uh, you know, I, I think in extreme cases where we have that kind of dialogue, it can help the the uh, the locality or VDOT, you know, reassess what what their budget is, where did they go wrong, and you know, maybe save some time on the front end, you know, by either you know delaying it, changing the budget, you know, whatever, so that you don't have to you know get a bunch of bids that are over budget, throw them out, and go back through the same process. And I would, I would, I would fathom a guess. Probably what I typically see on those rebids, you probably get less less participation the second time around. You know, it's it's kind of a mixed bag for us. It really depends on. Typically speaking, I my rule of thumb, and and this is I, my staff probably. I don't want to say I I don't. You know, to me, we shouldn't be rejecting bids and re advertising the same project. We should be changing the scope. If we're just at some point where it, it from a transparency standpoint, it looks too much like we're fishing, <laughs> you know, for a bid or a, a cost um, associated with that work. Um, if we're if we're rejecting a bid, then my expectation of the project development staff in the districts or central office is that we are we are significantly we are we are revisiting that project and in, in either addressing scope you know the key components schedule scope those or budget one of those things or all those things that we're reassessing and and reevaluating obviously we've packaged a project for for advertisement and ultimately construction so there's some need we just got to figure out how to make it work and we, to Buddy's point, we've we we've had those conversations through CAB, or I get a call from VTCA, where we we re we very quickly reassess, and we don't. The key here is we don't lose that that advertisement and letting cycle. We may delay it. It might instead of being let sixty days out, maybe it's ninety days out. But we're addressing it up front rather than having to bring in bids, reject bids, and then do this all over again. Well, and I can tell you too, and I'll, I'll I can make this commitment for Mike because I'm sure he's probably open to it. But if anybody ever has any questions uh, about uh, a project that they're getting ready or they're in the budget phase, and there's an item of work that you're not sure about that you can't estimate right or or anything, I, I wouldn't hesitate to pick up the phone and call myself or our estimators. Call Mike or or you know anybody in your local you know contracting community that you that you trust to to give you the right information because we we'd be glad to do that. And that's something just just so the the whole group we've estimates have been a big top, uh, subject of discussion over the last tw twenty four months give or say uh, give or take uh, we've had some pretty high. Uh, high profile projects go sideways from a planning level, from that original, you know, planning estimate, the, the actual evaluative or engineer's estimate, however you want to say it, actually was pretty close, but, but there's a big delta between what was anticipated from a funding perspective to actually what the project cost was. I can tell you that we VDOT are actively, um, trying to address those, those, those issues up front to, to, to give, um, a higher level of certainty on the back end, if that makes sense. So, 
But uh, again, buddy, Mike, thank you so much. I, I know this was a lot of time out of your busy schedules. I, I did um, try and do it after the letting. I know we had another contractor planning to participate, but they're chasing some other work as well. So we're always busy. Um, thank you again for all your time, your input, your uh, perspective. And with that, Russ, I don't know if you have, or Michaela, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so um, just thank you guys. Thank you, Harold, Mike, and um, Brian for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Um, we did record today's session, so we will have it posted on our external webpage on our outreach training site um, in about a week. Um, we do have another webinar that is scheduled coming up in December. This is going to be a repeat of the webinar that we had done in September, the performance metrics and project scheduling. Um, so we're having a repeat of that, that it's going to be on December 1st at 10 a.m. To register for that webinar, it was sent in the same email as the registration for this webinar series. Um, with that, um, Russ, do you have anything that you want to add? Hey guys, this is Penny. Um, Russ is, is um, based on his emails, he's, he's not here right now, but I wanted to thank you. Um, this has been a, a great session. No good deed goes unpunished. So we'll likely try to, to grab you again and see if we can continue this at a later date. But um, we appreciate your time. Hope everyone learned a lot and have a safe holiday. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.